The other possibility was that the 1893 lecturer was just short on the script. But there was something else going on beyond the chemistry and gravity that they knew of. Now that is what turned out to be the answer. And we're now going to take you through the century and give you the answer as to how the sun really works. Like detectives, we have to follow with the scientists step by step to see which clues they found and how they put them together. Now the first clue came just after a century ago, 1896, with the discovery of radioactivity. Now radioactivity is the sort of thing where you begin to feel, oh dear, this is all sort of <laughs> nuclear and bombs and so on and so forth. No, it's not. Radioactivity is completely natural. It's happening all around us now as I speak. In fact, we have developed as animals, we've evolved in a world where radioactivity is happening all the time. I shall demonstrate it to you now. Here are some common or garden objects, almost literally so. Here is a Geiger counter. If I switch it on, you're just listening at the moment to the odd crackle from background around us here. That is a lump of rock that you might pick up in Dartmoor. This is a ship's compass. This is a mantle from a gas lamp. Just remember the rock. We walk on rocks all the time. That's radioactivity. All around us, we have evolved in a radioactive background. That's okay. <laughs> so, you see there, common samples of radioactivity. So the scientists in 1896 wanted to know, what was this? What is this strange new emanation? And the people who made the most immediate impact on this were the famous chemists Pierre and Marie Curie. Now what they were doing was on the trace of radioactivity, trying to find out exactly what is it that's giving off this new power. And they started looking around, and they looked in mud and rock and every common or garden thing, and in pitch blend, they eventually discovered that something was going on. And chemically, they gradually filtered it down until they isolated the source. And they found some new elements that nobody knew of before. The first they called polonium, after Mary's home country of Poland. The second one was the most powerful radiation known, a new element which they called radium. Now, radium is such a powerful emitter that if you held it in your hand, it would keep you warm. If you turn off the lights, it would glow. If you dropped a single speck onto a photographic film, you could actually see the radiation being emitted from it, shooting out and leaving its traces all over the photographic plate. In fact, early in this century, Pierre Curie gave a talk here in the Royal Institution and unfortunately spilt on the floor some radium. Years later, scientists from Harwell came to the labs here and discovered the spot it was still pouring out radiation and they had to dig up the floor to deal with it because it was so harmful. So the Curies had really asked the questions. Radiation is happening, what's going on? And the person who then was the detective who started pursuing this to find the answers to the question was a famous New Zealand called Ernest Rutherford. This is Ernest Rutherford in his more dotage years when he was now Lord Rutherford, Order of Merit, Fellow of the Royal Society, Nobel Laureate, unlike when he first came over here when he was a nice young chap like me. <laughs> he came from New Zealand. It was like the brain drain in those days. Everybody wanted to come and work over here. This is where the action was. And so he went out on the path of radioactivity. He started looking for the various things. And from this, he began to discover that radioactivity came in many different forms. Let's repeat what he discovered. I've got here two different samples on the bench top. Let's see if we can hear them. That's certainly working. And that's certainly working. Now, let's see what happened if I put something in the way. So this is clicking away. You can see the dial. sheet of card cuts the clicks a little bit. On the dial, you'll see it cut quite back. This other source, nothing much happens at all. 
if I put a sheet of lead between it, then something does cut it off. But the piece of card doesn't do anything at all to this one, but to that one, it does. So what we've seen here is that there are two different types of emitter. The first, Rutherford being a good classical scholar, called alpha. And the second, he called beta. In fact, there are three, alpha, beta, and gamma. But these are the two that we're going to chase. The alpha particles, we know they're particles because when I put the cardboard in the way, they were stopped, the sound cut off. The alpha emitters are easily trapped, the betas penetrate. Two different forms of radiation. So at this point, Rutherford has shown that radioactivity was actually quite complicated. Wouldn't it be wonderful if we could go and see these particles? And that's what brings us to one of the great discoveries in the early years of this century, the development of the cloud chamber. Now, Bryson Gore has been building this cloud chamber here for several months. It's taken months of his life out. And indeed, this sort of thing here that Bryson has built, the word has already got around, and people are phoning up and asking advice on how to build these things from him. So this in itself is an amazing piece of apparatus that we've got here. Down the bottom here, we've got some coolant, which is keeping this whole evacuated thing at the top here nice and cool and mists are forming inside it. You can see the mists forming as we look. This originally was invented by a man called Charles Wilson. He used to go hiking in the Scottish Highlands. He really loved the, the mists and he tried to reproduce them in the laboratory. He wanted to make atmosphere of his own to study things with. And as a result of that, stumbled on this amazing fact that you will see shooting around little trails. Clouds seem to spontaneously form. The reason here is that in the middle we have got a source of radiation, an alpha particle emitter, an alpha radioactivity. The alpha particles are shooting out and as they do so, the mist forms on them. You're not actually seeing the particles, you're seeing their footprints, you're seeing where they have been. It's like a plane coming into land and you see the mist forming on the wingtips. Now this was such an amazing development that Rutherford himself said, at last we've got a telescope that we can look inside the atom and see what's going on. Here for the first time you're actually seeing matter breaking down, radiating away, the trails of those alpha particles shooting out into the mist. Now that is lovely. And I think Bryson's done a remarkable job here producing this for us. I find it amazing as I watch it. It's like eerie seeing these things happening right before us. Now what we could also do would be to surround this thing with magnets because then we would be able to start learning more about these particles. See, if they've got positive charge, the magnets would deflect them one way. And if they were negatively charged, the magnets would deflect them the other way. So by seeing what happens when we put magnets around, we start being able to tell what they're like, how fast they move, and so forth. 